like to hear all that activity. Sounds like life to me. We like uh, life in our church. I hope you're following along with us in our prayer journal. And uh, this is a, I think it's a five-week emphasis uh, leading up to Pentecost. It's entitled Praying Our Way to Pentecost. And uh, our prayer journals have been very good, I think. It doesn't take very much time uh, to complete each day. And uh, I'm enjoying it. The title of the message today is The Power of a Praying Church. The Power of a Praying Church. Have you ever had a dream that seemed so real you wondered whether it might have actually happened? You wake up and you think, did that really happen? Was, was that a dream? I'm not sure. Well, I had just the opposite this week. I, I woke up and I wished it was a dream, <laughs> but it was real. We were without water, but fortunately it turned out to be simple. In Acts chapter 12, Peter had the opposite experience. He had an event that seemed so unlikely, he thought it was a dream. So if you'll go to Acts chapter 12, it's been said, much prayer equals much power, little prayer equals little power, and no prayer equals no power. I don't think we're, most of us are totally convinced the effectiveness of prayer and the power of prayer. I think if we were completely advanced, convinced, we would probably do more of it. It's a powerful weapon. It's like a missile. Intercontinental ballistic, ballistic missile, you can send it anywhere in the world and it hits its target every time instantly. It's a tremendous weapon for good. It's also an evangelistic tool. People might tune you out. They might slam the door in your face if you try to witness, but they cannot keep the Holy Spirit from knocking at their heart's door when you pray and intercede for them. Someone said when we pray regularly, irregular things happen on a regular basis. Miraculous things. So I want to begin this morning by asking a question. Given, given the command to pray, we are commanded to pray by the way, Given the power of prayer, the effectiveness of prayer, and given all of the needs around us in our world today, are we praying as we ought? Are we praying as much as we ought? Are we praying as fervently as we ought? That's the question before us today. Our passage is Acts 12, starting with verse 1. King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church, intending to persecute them. He had James, the brother of John, put to death with a sword, and when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to seize Peter also. This happened during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. After arresting Peter, he put him in prison, handing him over to, the guard, to be guarded by four squads of four soldiers each. Herod intended to bring him out for public trial after the Passover. Verse 5 is the one I want you to catch. So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. Peter was in prison, but the church was praying. We call that intercessory prayer when we pray for someone else. They were praying on Peter's behalf. Peter was in a literal prison. Some of our loved ones may be in a literal prison, but I suspect that most of them are in a figurative, metaphorical prison. We probably all have acquaintances that are imprisoned by fear, anger, bitterness, guilt, grief, hurt, unforgiveness, addiction, and the list goes on and on. A figurative prison. When we're in prison, when we have loved ones who are in prison, spiritually, emotionally, physically, whatever the case might be, those people need intercessors. Those people need someone who's willing to stand in the gap, someone who's willing to represent them before God. We need to be that person. 
Every Sunday morning we have a time of prayer. Some of that prayer is spent in praise and thanksgiving, as it should be. Some of it is spent in time for prayer for ourselves, as it should be. But much of it is for others. And when we intercede to God on behalf of others, we call it intercessory prayer. The church prayed for Peter, and we have a responsibility to pray for one another. In 1 Samuel chapter 12, the people said to Samuel, Pray to the Lord your God for your servants. That, that was a smart thing to do, to go to the prophet and ask for prayer. That's where we should go when we have a need. And listen to Samuel's response in verse 23. He said, Far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord by failing to pray for you. Far be it that I should sin by failing to pray. That's what we call a sin of omission. It's when we, when we sin by not doing what we know we ought to do. Have you ever thought of it that way? Have you ever thought of it as a sin when you fail to pray for others? You see, the New Testament has a concept. It's called the priesthood of the believer. Did you know that you were a priest? Does that, seem, does that come as a surprise to think that as a believer you are a priest? We've been called to be an intercessor. We have been called to bridge the gap between sinful man and holy God. That's called the priesthood of the believer, and we have a responsibility to pray for one another. As we go through this passage in Acts 12, we'll see that the church wasn't just offering up token prayers. They were earnestly praying for Peter. They were serious. And as we'll see later on, we find that their prayers made a difference. And as I've been going through the prayer journals and reading and praying and meditating, and it, it motivated me to pray. My faith has increased in the power of prayer. Because we look there in verse 6, it says, The night before Herod was to bring him to trial, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains, and sentries stood guard at the entrance. Sleeping between two guards bound with chains in prison. Now that's what I call peace. Trust. Peter must have had someone praying for him. To be able to sleep in these circumstances, knowing that tomorrow you may die, knowing that there are two guards on either side of you and you're bound in chains, I can't imagine that being comfortable. And he was sawing logs. That's a testament to the peace that God can give. It's a peace that passes understanding. It's a peace that that the world can't give, the world can't take away. It's a peace that you can't really explain. Probably most of you have experienced it at one time or many times in your lives. Times in your life when you really ought to be stressed out. You ought to be freaking out. You're wondering, why, are you not, why am I so calm? And you realize, that's that peace the Bible talks about. That's the peace that Peter had in prison on the night before his potential death. The Apostle Paul tells us in Philippians 4, don't be anxious about anything. Not anything. Don't be anxious about anything. Or if you want to say it in a positive way, be anxious about nothing. And if you attended revival uh, with uh, our evangelist Nathan Johnson, you know what nothing means in Greek, right? Nothing. nothing. <laughs> don't, we don't have to complicate it. When it says don't be anxious about anything, it means nothing at all. Not one thing. But instead, instead of being anxious in everything by prayer and petition, those are types of prayers, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And, that's a connecting word, connecting to what he just said with what he's about to say. This is going to be the result, the peace of God. The peace that Peter felt at that point in time. 
trans, which transcends all understanding, you can't explain it, doesn't make sense to the natural mind, will guard, Peter knew about guards, it'll guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Don't be anxious, don't worry, don't fret, don't stew, don't be stressed out. Instead, present those things to God. And if you do, if you give it to Him, you'll have that peace we're talking about, and God will guard your hearts in Christ Jesus. Wow, that's, that's pretty good advice right there. Sounds like Peter was practicing what Paul preached. He was sleeping. God gave him a peace. And what was the church doing? They were praying. Maybe that's why P Peter was sleeping. <laughs> because they were praying. They were interceding on his behalf. Maybe Peter was so overcome. Maybe he just didn't know how to pray. Maybe he had prayed all he knew to pray. I don't know. But I do know the church was interceding on his behalf. I'll keep put that question out there. Do we pray for one another like we should? Do we intercede for one another? Verse 7 says, Suddenly, you think prayer doesn't change things? Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared, and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him up and said, Quick, get up. And the chains fell off of Peter's wrist. The chains fell off. Now these are literal chains. But sometimes emotional chains, spiritual chains, fall off. The NIV says the angel of the Lord appeared, but many versions say he stood by him. I like that imagery better. I like to think that when I'm going through a difficult time, the Lord or his angel is with me. It reminds me of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You remember the story? The book of Daniel. King Nebuchadnezzar threw them in the fiery furnace because they wouldn't bow. And he peeked in and he said, Didn't we throw three men into the fiery furnace? And weren't they tied up? And uh, his servant said, Why, yes, king, that's what we did. Three men tied up into the furnace. And he said, Well, now there's four. They're not tied up. They're walking around, and one of them looks like a god. Son of God, son of the gods, a lot of different translations. But R.C. Spruill calls this a Christophany. He says it's a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus himself in that fiery furnace. He stood beside those men just as he stood beside Peter, just like he stands beside us, he's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. He'll never leave us or forsake us. You might not be able to sense his presence sometimes. Sometimes he seems far away. But I'll guarantee you, if you haven't left him, he hasn't left you. Isaiah 43, verses 2 and 3, When you pass through the waters, I'll be with you. When you pass through the rivers, they'll not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you'll not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze, for I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Even in prison, God was standing beside Peter. The chains fell off of his wrists. And this event inspired Charles Wesley to write one of my favorite hymns. I like I like the modern choruses, I like the southern gospel, I like anything that's got the gospel message in it, but I really, really like what I call the big hymns, the 500 year old hymns, that are just packed full of power and theology and takes a great big voice to sing them or a great big choir or something, I just love and can it be. Considered one of the best loved of Wesley's 6,000 hymns. It was written in 1738 to describe his conversion to Christianity. He said, Long my imprisoned spirit lay, <clears throat> fast bound in sin and nature's night. Thine eye diffused a quickening ray. I woke, the dungeon flamed with light. My chains fell off. My heart was free. I rose, 
went forth and followed thee. My chains fell off. Excuse me just a minute. <clears throat> Oops, it's gone. I'm all right. I'm okay. God was responding to the prayers of the church as they interceded for Peter. Verses 8 and 9. The angel said to him, Put on your clothes and sandals, and Peter did so. Wrap your cloak around you and follow me, the angel told him. Peter followed him out of the prison, but he had no idea what the angel was doing. What was really happening, he thought he was seeing a vision. And that's where that first question came from. This was a real event that he thought was a vision. Then verse 10, they passed the first and second guards, came to the iron gate leading to the city. It opened by itself. They went through. When they'd walked the length of the one street, suddenly the angel left him. Then Peter came to himself and said, Now I know without a doubt that the Lord sent his angel and rescued me from Herod's clutches and from everything the Jewish people were anticipating. Verse 12, When this had dawned on him, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark, where many people had gathered and were having a potluck dinner? No. Super Bowl party? No. Finger foods? No. <laughs> Casseroles? Not a lot of the things that we like, and nothing wrong with those things. Not a lot of the things that we like to do when we get together as Christians. They were earnestly praying in the middle of the night. Now what happens next, I, I love to visualize because it's, it's humorous to me. Peter knocked on the door. They're praying. Okay, get the picture. They're praying for Peter to be released from, from prison. They're knocking on heaven's door and there's a knock at the door and Rhoda came to answer. When she recognized Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed, she ran back without even opening the door and exclaimed, Peter is at the door. Just get this picture. She's so excited she doesn't even let him in. He's still there. Thank you. I appreciate it. <clears throat> so that's the picture. And it gets better after that. The church is knocking at heaven's door with a request. And God is knocking at their door with the answer. Peter's already standing at the door. And here's what they said, verse 15. You're out of your mind, they told her. When she kept insisting that it was so, they said it must be his angel. Do we pray like that sometimes? We pray, God, do this and this and that, and we pray and we pray and we pray, but we don't really think it's going to happen. Don't bother me with the Peter at the door stuff. We're praying for Peter to be released. We're busy. Don't bother us with facts. Did they really be believe what they were praying for? It reminds me of a story I heard in uh, the missionaries in Africa were in the middle of a drought. They said, we're going to meet Sunday afternoon and we're going to pray for rain, and only one person brought an umbrella. That person was praying with faith. Peter kept on knocking, thank goodness. When they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. They were surprised their prayer was answered. I confess sometimes I am too. I'm surprised. I prayed, and it happened. <laughs> Wednesday night, I, I told the crowd this funny story. I got my watch face all messed up, and I couldn't get it back, and I couldn't, I'd swiped every way I could possibly swipe my watch face, and I couldn't get the one I needed, and I said, God, could I get my watch face back? And I swiped, and there it was. I mean, God cares about the smallest details of our lives. One version says they were amazed that their prayer was answered. They didn't believe they would get what they were praying for, I guess. I don't know. Maybe it was the way it was answered. Maybe it was the timing. Maybe they had a particular way they thought God was going to do this. Or maybe they had prayed God would he be found not guilty or something. Sometimes we dictate to God how he's going to answer our prayers. This wasn't what they were expecting. The old timers were right when they said much prayer equals much power. Doesn't it want to make you pray more? When you hear stories of answered prayer, 
makes you want to be known as a person of prayer. Sadly, we too often try to fix things ourselves and we only go to God as a last resort. How many times have you heard someone say, we've done all we can do, now all we can do is pray. Like that's a last resort. That's the best thing we can do. That should be our first resort. That's our best course of action. We only ask for help after we've tried everything else. Let's try starting with prayer next time. Many times we pray, get me out prayers, like God, get me out of this situation, get me out of this job, get me out of this financial mess. There's nothing wrong with that. I'm sure they were probably praying, get Peter out of this prison. And it was answered. But sometimes I think we need to pray, get me through prayers. In addition to praying for deliverance, sometimes we need to ask God to give us the grace to sustain, the strength to stand firm, the willpower to keep going. Maybe we're in our present situation for a reason. I'm impressed when Paul was in prison, he didn't pray, get me out. He said, help me to speak boldly. God, use this situation that I'm in for your glory. Sometimes we need to pray, get me through prayers. God, use this. The three Hebrews, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, didn't avoid the fire. They went through it. But whether, this is the good news, this is what I believe, whether it's out, over, around, or through, God's going to deliver us on the other side victoriously. Probably every one of us, if you're not going through a struggle right now, you just came out of one or you're getting ready to go into one because that's part of living in a fallen world in a sin-sick world. Maybe you've prayed a lot of get-me-out prayers. Maybe it's time to pray a get-me-through prayer. Lord, what are you trying to teach me in this season of life? Use this situation to build character, strengthen. Help. Maybe it's to minister to someone else. Maybe it's so that the comfort that I've received through this situation that I can share with someone else down the road. Whatever the reason, Lord, get glory from this situation. Work it together for good. I have confidence that God will get us through if we keep our eyes on Him. You remember the story of Peter when he stepped out of the boat. Peter get, he, you know, he gets a lot of criticism for taking his eyes off Jesus. I probably wouldn't have stepped out of the boat in the first place. At least he was on the water. He's only, the only other guy I know besides Jesus that's ever walked on water. But Peter was human, and he probably started looking around, and he saw the wind and the waves, and people don't walk on water. What, what am I doing? What was I thinking? And he began to sink. The same thing happens to us when we get in difficult circumstances. We start looking at the finances. We start looking at the health situation, and... We start looking at our own resources, and we start to sink. We sink spiritually. We sink, sink emotionally. We sink financially when we take our eyes off of Him. But He's all-sufficient. We have promises. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Storms deplete us. They distract us. In the middle of the storm, the enemy comes along and says, you ought to quit. There's no hope. Why bother? You're not going to make it. Nobody cares. Nobody's praying. Nobody's listening. You're all alone. You've probably heard all those lies, I imagine, before. But there's, if there's anything that's true, it's the fact that Satan's a liar. He's the father of liars. <coughs> Don't give up. Hold on to Jesus. Don't let go. Jesus, Jesus will either get you out or He'll get you through. Are we praying as we ought? Are we praying as we should? Are we interceding for one another? 
on a regular basis. I, I love that we have the prayer chain. You frequently get prayer requests on the prayer chain. I love it when I see on Facebook when people request prayer and we see so many people saying, I'm praying for you. And if you post that, make sure you actually do pray, that it's not just praying hands. Really do it. I love all of that. Because you can't get too much intercession. There's strength in prayer. There's strength in numbers. And just to know that this body is praying for each other. How would you like to know when you face the world tomorrow that all of these people here today were praying for you? Wouldn't that be wonderful? I knew I was going to preach this sermon, so yesterday while I was mowing the yard, I was praying for all of you. I named many of you by name as I was interceding for you as I was mowing. It was a win-win. It made the mowing go faster. <laughs> Plus, the prayers, they won't return void when you pray for one another. You think that would make a difference? I know it would. Let's commit to earnestly pray for one another. There's another benefit in praying. For, there's nothing wrong with praying for yourself. Don't get me wrong. But there's a benefit in praying for one another because you get your eyes off of yourself and your problems and your situation and you focus on someone else. It kind of lightens your own load when you pray for somebody else. Much prayer equals much power. Jesus said, my house shall be called a house of prayer. Let's make this church a house of prayer. Let's make this body, the temple of the Holy Spirit, a house of prayer. I know there is no doubt in my mind it will make a difference. Shall we stand? Father, we thank you so much for that faithful band of believers who were earnestly praying in the middle of the night for Peter's release. He's so fortunate to have a group of brothers and sisters like that. We want to be brothers and sisters like that. We want to pray for our friends when they're in distress. We want to pray for each other. We want to be intercessors. We pray, Lord, that you would bring people to mind that need prayer and that we would be faithful to lift them up. Help us to realize and to sense that our brothers and sisters are praying for us. Help us to get the strength and the assurance that we need in the difficult trials of life. We thank you for those that are in your house on your day with your people and pray a very special blessing upon each and every one that's here today. And we'll give you the praise for it. In Jesus' name, amen. You are dismissed.